Hey everybody, it's David. So today is going to be a Q&A video catching up with some of the questions that you've been posting in the comments section of our channel. But first off, I just wanted to give a special thank you to all of you who have subscribed to the channel thus far. And I also want to thank you for all of those nice comments that you've been putting down below as well. I read every single comment that you make and I try to respond to as many of you as I can. So let's get into the questions. I'm going to kick things off with Jane Birkby's recent video on how to characterize Proxima B's atmosphere. So there was a few questions and comments along a similar theme in response to that video notably about the economies of scale of existing telescopes, you know, just using them for longer versus building bigger and bigger new telescopes. So, for example, Mr. Combgun asks, is it possible we could acquire enough light in order to measure Proxima B's atmosphere just by having enough time on actual telescopes, which I think, I mean, existing telescopes. And David Wynn also commented, I would like to hear more about these economies and decisions on telescope time. So let's talk about how the signal to noise of a telescope scales as a function of how long we observe for versus just building a bigger and bigger telescope. What we really care about at the simplest level is really just the number of photons that we have collected of this star. So one really obvious way to do that is just to observe the star for longer. Indeed, if I stare at a star twice as long, I will collect twice as many photons. So the scaling of number of photons as a function of time is linear. In contrast, if I double the size of a telescope, which really means the diameter of the telescope, I'm actually not going to collect twice as many photons, I'm going to collect four times as many photons. That's because the area of a circle increases as the radius squared. So you might remember that from school, area of a circle is pi r squared. So this is kind of why astronomers like to build big telescopes. Now on top of that, remember that time itself is a precious commodity, right? I mean, there are only so many clear nights that we can observe the sky, there are only so many days in our lives, in our careers, for which we can actually do these observations. Finally, it's much easier for us to analyze the data if all of the observations came from a single time window, a single episode. The reason is because if we try to stitch together many, many different windows of time together, there could be very slight differences which lead to erroneous results. Now to get back to economics though, then we're really talking about the cost of the telescope, the cost of the observations themselves. There's a fantastic plot I'm showing here from a couple of astronomers, John Swift and John Johnson, and here they're showing how the cost of a telescope scales as a function of its aperture, basically how big is the telescope. What you'll notice is the amateur astronomy community are really driving down the price of small telescopes. And that's why those red points, which are all basically amateur sized telescopes, are pretty cheap. But when you get to those blue points, which are now telescopes which are so big, only a professional astronomer would be interested. Now these are really bespoke telescopes, so the companies making them charge a lot more for them. They are custom built. So when Professor Johnson noticed this huge gap in prices at about a meter sized telescope, he had the great idea of trying to add together many small telescopes, which are about a meter sized, rather than trying to build one giant telescope. That's what that green line is down there. You can see that for the same effective aperture size of these combined telescopes, it is still way cheaper to use the small telescopes than to have one big one. And there are definitely challenges with trying to add many small telescopes together like this, but the early results have been quite exciting. So I think this could be a really interesting experiment to see if Project Minerva can compete with these larger facilities. And of course, make sure you check out the link below for Project Minerva. So the next questions I picked out were on my video about the fallacy of how life's early emergence on the Earth cannot be used to say anything about how easily life starts. So a few of your questions here were asking, you know, what would it take for us to resolve this paradox? What kind of discovery would we need to prove the probability of life is very high. So Mark Russell asks, so would finding microbial life on Mars or Europa help support the life is easy hypothesis? Or would we still have to rule out that there wasn't a single source of life within the solar system? And I think Mark, you just hit the nail on the head with that last comment. I mean, if we discovered life on Mars today, tomorrow, how could we prove that it wasn't just life from Earth, which say hitched a ride on an asteroid landed on Mars and took root there. That idea is called panspermia. It could work either from the Earth to Mars or even in reverse from Mars to the Earth. I mean, we also can't prove that we're not all Martians, for example. We do know that the Earth and Mars certainly exchange material. For example, we have found many Martian meteorites which have arrived here on the Earth. And we also know that certain forms of life on the Earth are extremely hardy and could possibly survive hitching a ride on a meteorite from the Earth to the Mars. One example might be the tardigrade, which has been exposed to the vacuum of space on the International Space Station and survived. Perhaps the only way to tell if this was genuinely an independent start to life 
would be to do some genetic analysis and see if it was a common ancestor to us. But this kind of leads into a question that, well, this alien life form might not even have genes as we know them. It might not be DNA or RNA based. Indeed, this alien life form might be so exotic and different to us that we might not even recognize it as being a life form. This kind of leads into a question that was asked by THX1138 who said, I see a problem with proving life found outside of the Earth isn't related to us. Namely, we seemingly have only had one genesis event on the Earth. But there are a couple of reasons why that might not be true, and many, many genesis events may have already happened on the Earth. In the unrecognizable alien case, there could be an entire biosphere around us right now of life which we don't even recognize as being alive. This idea is not a new one, it's called the shadow biosphere. I'll put down a link below if you want to read more about this really intriguing idea. Aside from that, there is another perhaps more grounded way in which multiple abiogenesis events could have happened and we would not know about them. And the solution here is by competition. For example, even the very simplest microbial life that you find on the Earth today has hundreds, thousands of genes. It is actually a highly evolved organism. It is the result of four billion years of evolution. That means that as a result of Darwinian natural selection, these even simple microbial life forms are extremely fine-tuned to survive and thrive on the Earth. So even if another abiogenesis event occurs on the Earth, this new life form is going to be completely outcompeted and possibly even eaten by the existing life forms. As disturbing a thought as this is, it's kind of like taking my two-year-old toddler and asking her to compete in the NFL Super Bowl alongside with all of these professional athletes with years of professional training behind them. I mean, to be honest, there's no way she's going to be able to compete with them. So on that unsettling note, Thank you so much for all of your questions, which I've hopefully responded to some of you here. Let me know if you like these Q&A videos or if you have any other questions which have arisen as a result of this Q&A down below in the comments. You can expect a new Cool Words video coming your way next week about a new paper that we just had accepted, which is, well, just to give you a tease, it's on the connection between artificial neural networks and exoplanets. So until next time, thank you so much for watching this video and stay curious.